by Govanen. Welcome to Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And recently, Stephen over at the Red Book did a video in his appendices series where he does a rather long video addressing questions that were dropped in comments on his regular videos throughout the month. And one of the videos that he covered was a video on whether Sauron took the One Ring to Numenor. I had touched on this topic in a video myself earlier, but the focus of my video was more on how come if he could take it to Numenor and then carry it away as a spirit, he couldn't then carry it away as a spirit when Isildur cut it off of his hand at after the War of the Last Alliance. So there wasn't really any exact overlap between our videos, but I made a comment on his video, which he addressed in his appendices video, to the effect that you know, the only thing that I'm not sure that I completely buy about Tolkien's explanation in the letter where he specifically says that Sauron took the ring to Numenor is the idea that he needed he, the ring, well, not necessarily needed the ring, but used the ring to have greater effect on the men that he was trying to corrupt in Numenor. And... Uh, as is the nature of most comments on the internet, it was a rather short comment and may not have completely explained my position, and so Stephen had some comeback to that in his appendices video where he used a lot of examples to show that it does seem like the ring confers, you know, this kind of power. And so what I want to do here is explain my position a little bit more and explain why I don't think that Sauron gets any additional benefit to his ability to corrupt minds from his own ring. So, and I'll, you know, just as a caveat to this, I'm not saying that I disagree with Tolkien's explanation in his letter. I think that, you know, if this is his idea of what the ring does, then that's what the ring does. I just never got that idea out of reading the text itself. And so, therefore, when he says that in a letter, it seems almost like post hoc rationalization to me. That doesn't mean it was post hoc rationalization. It just kind of seems like it on the surface. And that's why I have a little bit of a harder time buying it than I do a lot of the other things that Tolkien writes in his, what we might call, non-canon writings and explanation. So let me get into the details of this. The first thing I want to point out here is... My overall point is not that the ring grants no ability to influence others to anybody. It certainly does, to some extent. Uh, obviously, what my whole idea of what the ring does, you can get this out of the comment that I left, was that the ring was specifically designed to influence and indeed dominate other ring bearers. So if you know, somebody had one of the other great rings of power, the three elven rings, the seven for the dwarf lords, or the nine for the kings of men, those would be, those would, you know, people would be dominated by the wielder of the one ring, even if that wielder is not Sauron. Now, as Galadriel tells Frodo, you have to have a certain amount of strength to be able to do that. You can't just put the ring on the first time ever and just instantly dominate anybody wearing those rings. Otherwise, Frodo would be able to control the Nazgul, and he can't. <laughs> so, that is the point of the ring, but you need more than just the ring. You need a certain amount of inherent power and, indeed, probably some training of your own will, as Galadriel indicates, to the domination of other wills. So, that is the impression that I get from the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power section in the Silmarillion, you know, all the, the basic writings that we get on the topic, that is the point of the One Ring. The One Ring is not something that Sauron creates to just be a general buff to his stats, let's say. So, when I say that Sauron doesn't get any additional benefit from the Ring, the real point that I'm making is that Sauron, to the extent that he gets any benefit from having the ring, is not so much to the fact that he has additional ability to dominate or control or influence other people because he forges the ring outside the group of ring bearers. 
it's that he gets especially high ability to influence those people and as relates to anybody else his ability to influence them becomes less without the ring because a lot of his innate power is put into the ring but his ability to influence others beyond the ring bearers is the same essentially before and after the forging of the ring so this is kind of the idea here is that there's a trade-off the trade-off being Sauron to gain a special influence over the other ring bearers in the world externalizes a lot of his power into the ring which therefore creates the risk of being separated from that power but gains that ability to heavily influence and dominate those particular individuals the externalization of that power is put into a ring for the same reason that the other people have you know their whatever power is in those rings it's whatever the magic or technology involved is that's just how it works and how it's you know how it's done and of course that's not something that Tolkien ever gets into the minute science of we might say but nevertheless that is what happens and this goes back to the idea of Morgoth's ring that Tolkien really explores in the volume of that name in the history of Middle Earth. Christopher Tolkien puts together a lot of different documents that explore Tolkien's writings on trying to reshape the Silmarillion in his later life. And he starts really looking at some of the metaphysics of his universe. And some of that ends up going into this idea of Morgoth's ring being Arda itself. Arda is his ring in the sense that Sauron puts his power into the One Ring in order to gain externalized power over others, but Melkor, Morgoth, does the same thing with Arda itself. He puts a lot of his power into the very Earth to gain influence over a lot of it and the creatures within it and that sort of thing. So by doing that, Morgoth manages to gain a lot of additional control over creatures and just nature itself in some ways that he would not have had otherwise. But it diminishes his overall power, and that's why when the Valar attack him at the beginning of what we might call the First Age, when the elves awake, they find that he is a much reduced person. He is you know, expended a lot of his power into external things and therefore reduced his inherent power and that makes him easier to conquer as a person. Now, a lot of that power they have to get rid of by kind of taking care of his minions, orcs, balrogs, all this stuff. But the point is, Morgoth doesn't become a more powerful person overall by externalizing all this. He gains a lot of additional ability to create war and do other things and gains more control over certain aspects of Middle Earth and maybe other parts of Arda as well by doing all of this. But he does not become better at what he does per se. He just makes it easier to do certain things but then harder to do other things because he has diminished himself in some sense. Sauron, I see, is doing the same thing. He takes the Ring of Power, externalizes a lot of his innate strength into it, thereby gaining the con ability to control other ring bearers. And this is a necessary thing. He has to put his strength into the ring in order to gain that level of control. But this does not make him more influential over other people. So that's my explanation of what I, from reading just the basic texts, get out of all this. So I'm not saying that that is correct. Again, if Tolkien had the idea that it does actually increase his ability to influence other people, then that's fine. I just have a harder time buying it. Now I want to kind of get into some of the reasons why and some of the reasons why what Stephen talked about on his appendices video still don't t entirely convince me. So Stephen's overall point, of course, is that based on Tolkien's letter, we can assume that when... Sauron took the ring to Numenor, he's using the ring in part to influence other minds. And one of the things that I said in my comment on his video originally before the appendices was 
if he could do that mainly through the use of his ring, it seems a little bit odd that he would be able to so easily dominate Saruman later in the Third Age when Saruman is a much stronger character and therefore should be harder to influence, but at that point Sauron no longer even has the ring. So it seems like Sauron ought to have you know, roughly the same ability to influence other people with or without the ring other than for that group of ring bearers, right? So that whole idea to me was one of the key factors that May, makes me think that Tolkien might not have completely thought through his comments in that letter. And, you know, given time and, you know, to think about it more, might have, again, changed his mind. Stephen's response was mostly to point out, well, look at all these other instances of people using the ring to influence others. And one of those is Gollum specifically. Gollum becomes influenced by Frodo's use of the ring because Frodo effectively curses him with the ring. He puts, you know, he just holds the ring and cows Gollum on the slopes of Mount Doom, that sort of thing. There's also several other cases that he brings up of, you know, if Galadriel, say, were to obtain the ring, she would be a lot more powerful and, you know, this, there's several other people that we can imagine. Gandalf says that he would become more powerful if he had the ring. All of that I agree with, right? The difference here is that all of these people are not gaining, let's say, a buff to their stats based on externalizing their own power here. The buff to their stats is based on the fact that it is Sauron's power that they are adding to their own. Whatever power Sauron put into the One Ring, they are now accessing that in addition to whatever native power they have. As to the Gollum example, I don't even necessarily think we have to assume that Frodo is gaining like a buff to his stats so much here. Frodo himself explains this by saying early on when Gollum swears his oath, you know, the ring mastered you long ago. If you swear by the ring, it'll hold you, but it'll twist your words and you may end up, you know, in a situation that you don't like because it'll, you know, you are a slave to the ring at this point, and therefore, if I were to command you to do something while holding or using the ring, you would do it. And Frodo's point there is not, I have this power over you because I have the ring. No, it's the ring that has the power over Gollum, and therefore, anything that he, you know, swears to by or on the ring that's going to hold him whether he likes it or not. And it's going to be something that, you know, Frodo is going to be able to control him with the ring, not because Frodo per se gets additional stats out of it, but just because Gollum is already, it wouldn't matter who or what was using the ring. The ring just has that level of mastery over Gollum at that point so that whoever uses it has some control over Gollum because Gollum is just, He's just a slave to the ring. That doesn't mean Frodo gets more influence in, in the sense that his charisma stat in a D-style thing goes up or that his will becomes stronger over Gollum or anything like that. He's, it's just like the ring is like a leash that has Gollum on the other end of it and Frodo just happens to hold the other end of the leash. So I don't think that really addresses the point that I was making. And I don't think that the other examples really address the point that I was making either because, again, to the extent that all these other people are gaining additional power or whatever out of the ring, it's because they have their own native power and they are adding Sauron's power to themselves. Whereas my point with Sauron was, what is he adding to himself with the ring? It's his own native power. The trade-off here for Sauron was... I have to externalize some of that into this ring technology that I can then use to dominate other people using that kind of technology in these other rings. And that means I can control them through the technology of the ring, but I have alienated some of my own native strength from myself and therefore made myself more vulnerable in some sense. He never expected that to matter because he never expected to lose the ring, but that was the trade-off. He can't buy merely externalizing his power just buff all of his stats. I don't think that's the way it works. So in other words, 
absent all the other rings being made, I don't think Sauron could have been like, you know what, I just want to become more powerful, and so I am going to put a lot of my native power into a piece of jewelry that I can wear, and everywhere I go, I'm going to have plus two to charisma, plus two to strength, plus two to agility, plus two, you know, that that's not what the ring is. And so my my quibble with Tolkien is that I don't think that Sauron gets any ability to influence other people from the ring that he didn't already have, other than those ring bearers. If, say, Galadriel or Gandalf acquired the ring, they would acquire the ability to control other ring bearers and anybody else that Sauron had a native ability control, like, say, orcs, and this kind of goes to a video that I did on who might be able to use the ring and how effectively. I did a video on that that you can look at. In that video, I was speculating that to use the ring is to be able to do the things that Sauron could do with the ring, effectively, or that he could do himself. So, Sauron could control other ring bearers. So, if Gandalf acquired the ring, he would be able to look into Galadriel's mind, control her to an extent, as long as she's wearing Ninja. Same with Elrond. Same with, you know, if a dwarf had the ring, he wouldn't be able to do that as well, because even Sauron couldn't manage to do that. Dwarves are just built not to be dominated. But the Nazgul? You know, could Aragorn potentially learn to control the Nazgul by exercising his will and using the ring? Possibly, because they are also slaves to the ring in the same way that Gollum is. Frodo never achieves that because he doesn't, A, practice enough with it, and B, might not have enough willpower to do it. But Tolkien even hints, and I think this is in another letter, although I can't remember where, it's been so long since I read it, that if the Nazgul had actually made it to Mount Doom, Frodo could have kind of controlled them enough to not just be killed by them outright, and they would have kind of had to play a little game of subterfuge with him and take him to Sauron for Sauron to kill him and take the ring back. Because they do have some limits on them in terms of interacting with the One Ring. And so Frodo might have been able to control them a little bit, enough to prevent them from doing something just as simple as, I'm just going to kill you, take the ring. But they would have still been slaves to Sauron, not just the ring, and therefore they would have done his will just in a way that was kind of limited by their ability to resist Frodo, the ring bearer. So... There's a hint there that if you had a ring bearer of sufficient strength, they would be able to control the Nazgul. And therefore, you know, you have a problem for Sauron there. Because if Aragorn or Gandalf or Galadriel gains control of the Nazgul, you know, those are some of his best weapons in the war. So that's the kind of thing that I see as being a... An, a a skill that you can obtain, essentially, by using the One Ring. You can control Nazgul, potentially, Orcs, potentially, because Sauron natively has the ability to control Orcs for the same reason that, you know, Morgoth could. You know, Morgoth put a lot of his power into being able to just dominate Orcs, and Sauron kind of inherits that. So those are two things that I think you could do with the One Ring, even if you're not Sauron, because you would kind of inherit Sauron's ability to do those things by obtaining the One Ring. But I don't necessarily think that Gandalf, if he acquired the One Ring, would be able to just influence people, you know, more than whatever Sauron's ability to influence people was put into the ring. Now, here's where it gets a little nuanced. Does Sauron put some of his power to influence or dominate other wills into the ring just as a general matter? If he does, then he needs the ring to have his full capacity to do that. Now, if he doesn't, then he doesn't need his ring to have a full capacity to do that, except as to the ring bearers, obviously. So, it's possible that there is power in the ring to influence other minds, whether or not they have a ring, of their own, and if that's the case, then Sauron might need the ring to influence other minds other than ring bearers 
to the extent that he needs to have the ring on him to be at full power himself. Because when he doesn't have the ring with him, he is missing a great deal of the power that he natively has, which is why destroying the ring effectively renders Sauron a non-threat. It doesn't absolutely kill him or destroy him, but it renders him impotent. He is no longer a threat to Middle-earth because so much of his native power was put into that ring that destroying it just dissipates it forever and it's gone. So that much I can understand, right? I can understand that his ability to influence and dominate other wills just as a native thing could be in the ring, and therefore his ability to influence others is somewhat incumbent upon having the ring on him, and therefore he would not leave it in Baradur, but would take it to Numenor with him to make his job of corrupting the Numenorians easier. That much I get. The tricky part to me comes in when you start saying his ability to just influence generally is actually increased beyond its native ability by possessing the ring, because that, again, just seems kind of like a weird general buffing of stats type thing. And if that was all he wanted, why did he need to go through the process of getting all the ring bearers? Just, like, make yourself a really nice piece of jewelry that buffs all your stats and you're a lot tougher to take out. Uh, I mean, obviously there's still reasons to do it specifically the way he did it. But it still kind of begs the question, why not just make magic jewelry all the time and buff your stats? Um... I mean, this is. I, I, it sounds like I'm making making light of the way Tolkien does this. I'm really not. I'm just trying to draw the best analogy I can. But the reason that this seems tricky to me is because if Sauron's ability to influence other people is diminished without the ring, as I said before, how do we then explain his ability to corrupt Saruman so easily? Now, Saruman is already kind of going the wrong path by the time that we meet him in the Lord of the Rings and in the Unfinished Tales we get more development of that and Tolkien shows that he was going that way a long time possibly even before he ever looked into the Palantir and was ensnared by Sauron. Nevertheless he was ensnared by Sauron. Now Saruman is himself kind of diminished in a sense by being incarnated rather than being in his native form as a Ainu or Maya and therefore, you could say, well, Sauron is weaker, but Saruman is also weaker. I don't necessarily like that by itself, because if Sauron is so much weaker if the wing ring is destroyed that he has no power at all, effectively, then if the ring is just separated from him, he still should have relatively little power. His ability to ensnare Saruman should be pretty low. Um... And I can understand how he could corrupt Sauron and make him think that what he's doing is in his own benefit or something like that and trick him. What I can't understand there is how he would be able to actually dominate Sauron, which seems to be what Gandalf thinks has happened. Gandalf implies that Saruman is working for Sauron even when he thinks he's working for himself and that he is, you know, ultimately not even really in his, in control of himself anymore, completely. Now, you could put that down to just being fooled, but I think, ultimately, Saruman actually has, you know, been dominated in some sense by Sauron, and therefore is, he's kind of beyond being rescued, short of an extreme act of grace, more or less, to step in, and he almost saves himself when Gandalf visits him, but he's so far gone at that point, he can't even bring himself to do it. Um, so, you know, I can understand maybe Sar Sauron kind of fooling Saruman. I can't understand him being able to dominate him or to, to really just kind of cow him in any sense, which he seems to have done, because Saruman is afraid. Saruman is not in a position to be thinking that, oh, I've got this Sauron thing taken care of. That's why he needs the ring so bad. He has to get the ring to stand a chance in any of this, and that's why he goes after it so hard. So that's the thing that seems to me to be really tricky about all this, is the idea that Saruman 
is dominated in some sense by Sauron, who therefore apparently still has plenty of ability to do that, even though so much of his power is in the ring that once it's destroyed, he's effectively nothing. That's why I find this so hard to believe that the ring doesn't just, you know, focus his ability, but rather increases his overall ability to influence other people. That, to me, just seems a little weird. Because if that was the case, I mean, you would think he would have to put a lot of his native strength of just influence in general, and therefore without that, how is he influencing Saruman or even Denethor as much as he is? And this brings me to my final point, which is, what really is the evidence outside of Tolkien's letter that the ring would have given Sauron the more greater ability to just influence people in general? I don't think there's any evidence in any of the texts outside that one letter that he wrote to suggest that Sauron could, after the forging of the ring, influence other people more easily than he could before. I'm not aware of any. Now, it's kind of unfair in one sense to make that argument in the sense that we get very little interaction with Sauron. You know, Sauron interacts with so few people after he loses the ring that, or even when he has the ring, really, that it's really hard to make any kind of a judgment one way or the other because we just don't get to see that in action for the most part. I mean, he does influence Denethor and he does influence Saruman and he corrupts the men of Numenor, but we don't really get enough detail on any of that to understand how he's doing it, what's, you know, the mechanism going on there. With the men of Numenor, we have a pretty good reason to think that a lot of that is just playing on their own problems, because at that point, most of the Numenorians are already corrupt. Our Farazon is already looking for ways to gain immortal life, and Sauron just plays on that and uses that to get him to go full hog and try to just conquer Valinor, and of course that was never going to work. But Sauron played on that fear he had and used it to his own advantage to corrupt him even further to the point that he was no longer even afraid to attack the Valar outright. With Denethor and Saruman, that just goes back to my other problem of if he had greater ability to influence with the ring, what's his ability to influence without it? So, you know, I don't know that any of these data points help us a whole lot, and there's just no evidence in any of the stories themselves that Sauron with the ring is better at dominating other wills. We got a pretty good idea that he's pretty good at dominating other wills one way or the other. I mean, after the fall of Numenor, he takes the ring with him, and after that is said to have become so... His, his physical form that he's kind of stuck with now is so, you know, daunting that, you know, few people could withstand his eye. Now, does that mean he can just daunt people by looking at them? Probably. <laughs> does he need the ring to do that? I suspect not. Uh, I, I don't think he needs the ring to daunt people by just staring at them because he's just that evil and powerful. Uh, but it's... And, and there's certainly nothing in the text that indicates the ring is what makes him like that. It's his, his form itself that is said to be, you know, black and evil and not, you know, not friendly, let's say. <laughs> uh, but this, this is the problem is there's very little evidence anywhere in the text on this point. And then we get this one letter where Tolkien says that, oh yeah, he was using the ring to corrupt people. Now again, I can buy that up to the level of saying without the ring, his, his ability to do that would be diminished because so much of his native power was put into the ring. But then the question is, how is he still doing all of those things after he loses the ring? He is still controlling orcs. He is still corrupting Saruman. He is still corrupting Denethor. He's doing all of these kinds of things that he could do before without the ring so, in what sense is the ring so necessary that he needs it to corrupt the already 
almost entirely corrupt king and most of the nobility of Numenor. This is where I find it hard to believe that Tolkien really thought through all the implications of what he was saying to the point that I think, you know, maybe he would have changed his mind had he thought about it a little bit more. That's not to say that you can't come up with some kind of explanation for why this is true, but ultimately that's my explanation of why the arguments don't 100% convince me that if you just read the stories by themselves, never looked at Tolkien's letters or anything else, I don't think you would necessarily come away with the conclusion that with the Ring of Power, Sauron has you know, an increased ability to just influence people generally. I don't see any evidence of that in the text. I see some evidence that seems to imply that he has no problem influencing people without the ring, and therefore I see no reason why, once we read that letter, we have to assume that, yeah, he needed the ring in order to influence these people who were already so far corrupt that they just needed like a little nudge over the edge. That is why... I find it a little bit harder to buy that part in the letters. And, you know, all of Stephen's arguments, like I said earlier, they all relate to specific things that would actually make sense, even with my understanding of it, because Gollum is a slave to the ring. All these other people who would gain power with the ring are gaining that power because they're gaining something that Sauron put into the ring. So that's my explanation of why I made that comment. And that was, you know, the, the point here is not so much to disagree with Stephen's analysis, it's to further explain what I was trying to get at and why I have that thought process because in my short little YouTube comment, I didn't put enough information to really get into all this detail and explain why I have this thing in the back of my mind that's like, I'm not sure I completely buy that. Uh, so I just wanted to make this video in order to give that explanation to, you know, put all this into a more robust discussion so as to be a little less vague about my reasoning and a little clearer as to what exactly I meant in the comment. So anyway, if Stephen thinks he's got, you know, even more to say on this that would show why I'm wrong, you know, comment or, heck, leave another video response. We could go at this forever and just have self-generating content for the rest of our lives. Not really. I'm not going to do that. But, you know, it's a really interesting discussion one way or the other. And if anybody else has thoughts, I hope they leave comments. Because this is one of those things where Tolkien leaves just enough nuggets to make it a really interesting conversation without giving us enough that we can ever 100% pin down everything that he might have thought on the topic. He just never got into that. His magic system, to the extent that we want to call it that, is a relatively soft magic system. He never explains how magic works, what its limits are. There clearly are limits, and we can infer a lot of those, but that's just it. We have to infer a lot of stuff based on what he writes, and we have very little to go on in some cases, and this is one of those. So I think it's a really interesting topic to talk about. I hope this explained my position a little bit better. And, you know, I, if I went long and seemed to ramble, it's because I'm trying to really nail down my exact objection and, and hesitation on this subject. So with that said, I'll leave it there as usual. Social links in the description below. Twitter, I, on Twitter, I, of course, drop Tolkien-related trivia questions. And I will see everybody on the next one. Signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel, Namadie. Thanks to all my Patreon and Utreon supporters, including Ringbearers Ego Voice and Emir Ali, and Elf Friends PA Brew News, Tracy Meehan, Nathan DeFore, and Paul Leone.